The U.S. dollar is king when it comes to global financial transactions. Yet there is talk of the dollar's impending doom. And some nations are already moving away from using the dollar for international business. Dale Hurd explains why and what the dollar's demise could mean for your pocketbook. There's been plenty of talk lately that the U.S. dollar could lose its reserve currency status. Is King Dollar going to be tossed off of its throne? The world has become too dependent on the U.S. dollar. Analysts have been warning of the dollar's impending doom. A growing number of nations are turning away from the greenback as a payment currency. And that has led to fears that the U.S. could lose its position as the world's top reserve currency. Reserve currencies are held in large quantities by central banks and other nations for financial stability and are used in international trade. It's been a big advantage for the U.S. economy. For instance, the federal government can pay for any foreign expenditures by simply printing more money. If the dollar were dethroned as the world's reserve currency, some have warned that we would see soaring inflation and a catastrophic drop in our standard of living. Other economists, however, believe the effect would not nearly be that dramatic. Experts not only fail to agree on whether the dollar is doomed to lose its reserve currency status, they also differ on what the economic fallout would be if it did. Pete Earle at the American Institute for Economic Research is one of many economists who say there is no short-term threat to the dollar's reserve currency status because there just aren't better options. The Federal Reserve has made a lot of mistakes, and certainly they debauched the, the value of the dollar. But in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. The Fed is still very much the gold standard in monetary policy. And he says there is no reason to be worried that the dollar will be replaced by the Chinese yuan. The odds that the Chinese renminbi or, or yuan will, will take the dollar's place are at, at present slim to none. The reason is China won't do what it takes to become a top reserve currency. It won't allow the yuan's value to float, but pegs it to the dollar. And its capital markets are largely closed to investors. The U.S. has the deepest capital markets in the world. So if you want to be a reserve currency, so-called, you need a, a bond market. You need a securities market, a big one. And you need a lot of other features, a network of dealers, underwriters, settlement, clearance, custodians, depositories, uh, hedging options, uh, repo, futures, options, you know, etc. And... Uh, above all, you need the rule of law. Who trusts the Chinese? Nobody. Who trusts the Russians, really? Well, nobody. Talk of a BRICS currency involving Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa is still largely just talk. America's share of the reserve currency market has fallen, but mostly because of the creation of the euro. If the dollar were replaced as the world's reserve currency, your money would be worth less. Foreign goods would cost more, inflation would increase, and the U.S. government would have to rein in its runaway spending because fewer nations would be buying U.S. treasuries and financing our huge federal debt. Nations currently ditching the dollar as a payment currency is a more pressing issue. Some nations are dropping the dollar simply to cut out the middleman. They want to use their own currency when trading. Others are afraid of a weaponized dollar after the U.S. froze hundreds of billions of dollars in Russian reserves because of its invasion of Ukraine. Others want to see America's economic dominance weakened. This is a potential near-term threat to the dollar's value. But most economists say that any threat to the dollar's reserve currency status is many years, if not decades, away. Dale Hurd, CBN News. I think the biggest threat to the dollar is digital currency. And as that takes over transactions, uh, the dollar is likely to be left behind. So technology is going to do it. But we are hastening that day. And the reason we're hastening that day is we're spending way too much money for government programs. Uh, when you start co crossing $30 trillion in national debt, that gets everybody concerned. Uh, not too long ago, a delegation from China came. Uh, at that point in time, China held over a trillion in U.S. Treasuries. And they're very pointed in their question, are you going to monetize your debt? What that means is, are you just going to print more money in order to cover your shortfall and increase the float of the dollar? 
Well, does the Federal Reserve have the ability to do that? That's why they call it expansion of their ledger. So, yes, uh, that's out there. In response to our response to China, they said, well, we're going to sell these. We, we don't want to hold on to them. We're going to go to something else. That's why people are looking for another currency. When they start looking and landing on a stable digital currency, which is yet to emerge, but when it does, that will be the end of the U.S. dollar. In other news, President Biden is cutting short his visit to the Asia-Pacific region to deal with the debt ceiling crisis. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The president leaving today for the G7 summit in Japan. Instead of stops in Papua New Guinea and Australia afterwards, he'll return home to Washington Sunday to work on the debt ceiling. After a White House summit Tuesday, the president sounded confident of a deal, while House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says there's no guarantee. We just finished another good productive meeting with our congressional leadership about a path forward to make sure that America does not default on its debt. That doesn't mean we're going to get to an agreement. All it means is I think the process is a better process, is something I've been requesting for a long time, that gives us a structure to actually be more productive, but a short time frame to get it done. Topics on the table include stricter work requirements for those on government aid and reclaiming $30 billion in unspent COVID funds. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warns the debt ceiling must be raised by June 1st to avoid a government default. Well, North Carolina Republicans overrode the governor's veto to establish a 12-week abortion ban in the state. Democrat Governor Roy Cooper blocked the bill over the weekend and tried to persuade several Republicans to support his move. In a party-line vote, both houses, though, overrode the veto. The law includes exceptions for rape or incest through 20 weeks of pregnancy, life-limiting fetal anomalies up to 24 weeks, and when the mother's life is in danger. Well, Republicans in the House of Representatives accuse the FBI of a double standard in enforcing a law that protects both abortion clinics and crisis pregnancy centers. A House Judiciary Subcommittee Tuesday heard testimony of ongoing attacks against pro-life clinics and churches nationwide. George Thomas has more. Last Wednesday, when Bob Perron saw three decapitated animals in front of this pro-life clinic, his first thought? I would call it some kind of ritualistic attack. Perron, who heads the Catholic-run JMJ Pregnancy Center in Orlando, told CBN's Faith Wire that he was shocked when he saw the remains of the animals in front of the building. There was a huge chicken with its head cut off. There was another huge bird with its head cut off. And then um, a baby lamb um, that is, had been decapitated. The group Catholic Vote says 157 churches and 87 pregnancy resource centers and other pro-life organizations across the country have been attacked since the draft Supreme Court opinion proposing to reverse Roe v. Wade was leaked in May 2022. And these attacks have included firebombings and vandalism that includes phrases written in graffiti like Quote, if abortions aren't safe, neither are you. It included smashing of windows, um, targeted online harassment, protesters threatening violence outside pregnancy resource centers and churches, and many other acts. On Monday, Republicans on the House Judiciary Subcommittee held a hearing accusing the Biden administration and the Justice Department of using the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances, or FACE Act, to unfairly target pro-life activists for prosecution. Let me tell you what that is. That is called selective prosecution in violation of the Constitution. You cannot make prosecutorial decisions because you want to make an example out of somebody who's a well-known anti-abortion or pro-life activist. Among those who testified was pro-life activist Mike Hawk, who was arrested in front of his seven children last fall during a pre-dawn raid on his home by armed FBI agents for allegedly violating the FACE Act. A jury found him not guilty of the federal charges earlier this year. They show up at your house, 20 agents, guns drawn in front of your family, in front of them. Why do you think they did it? The intention was to humiliate me, to scare my children, and to instill fear in pro-life America. The FACE Act, among other things, makes it a crime to cause damage or destruction to a reproductive health care facility or place of worship.
Despite the hundreds of attacks against churches and pro-life facilities since last year's abortion ruling, the Justice Department has brought only four indictments under the FACE Act against pro-abortion activists, compared to the 26 pro-life activists allegedly facing similar violations. The Biden administration has shown a clear double standard of enforcing the FACE Act in a way that protects pro-abortion activists and facilities while substantially ignoring attacks on pro-life advocates, facilities, and churches. And it is a disgrace that the Justice Department would rather cater to the pro-abortion political movement than protect places that assist pregnant women in need. George Thomas, CBN News. Some disturbing attacks. Thanks, George Gordon. Back to you. I never thought I'd see ideology governing the FBI, but that's exactly what we're dealing with here. It's an ideology. Uh, the ideology is, well, they're, they're pro-choice at the top levels, and therefore they're going to selectively enforce the law there. Uh, and if, if they were pro-life, would they do, do it the, the other way? I, I, I kind of doubt it. Uh, it, it. It's just, it's a shame when the institutions of our government are no longer trusted by the citizens, and that's what we're getting into now. Uh, when you look at the Durham report and the FBI weaponized against an incoming president, uh, it wasn't just a candidate, but it was in the first years of his presidency. When you see this selective enforcement that if you're uh, a, a praying on a sidewalk and, and that gets 20 agents at your front door in a pre-dawn raid, uh, well, what's that about? It, yeah, absolutely, it's about intimidation. And it's trying to enforce a specific ideology or support a particular candidate for president. Uh, and it seems to be throughout the Bureau. It also seems to be throughout the intelligence services. And it seems to be with, within the, the bureaucracy of Washington, D.C. You know, what happened with that Hunter Biden laptop is, uh, is actually a national shame that during a presidential election, campaign officials for a particular candidate could drum up, uh, well, this is somehow Russian disinformation. Well, no, it wasn't. And, and now that we know that, what, why aren't heads rolling that, you know, you, you have violated uh, uh, prohibitions against pro participating in presidential politics. It's just, it's amazing to me that, that they don't get the, the fundamental. And the fundamental is when the citizens no longer trust their government, when you think something is happening not because somebody violated the law, but because they're on the wrong political side, that these things are happening that way, well, then you lose faith in the government. And we can't get that back. You can't get that back once you lose that trust. So that's what we're looking at in America today. Do you trust the FBI? Do you trust the Justice Department? Do you trust our current Secretary of State? He was the campaign official that uh, made that talking point about a laptop. Do, do you trust what they're going to say to you now? Do you trust our news media now? They're the ones that quash the story but do you trust them? Are you going to say, well, you lied to me once. Nah, are, you, are you lying now? These things are fundamental to our culture. And are you destroying it for a short-term political victory? Are you destroying it for some kind of ideological reasons? Well, please stop. We need to be able to trust the government. We need to be able to trust political candidates. And especially, we need to be able to trust news media. Well, five current members of Congress are ordained ministers, three in the House, two in the Senate. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is one of them. He goes back to Atlanta every Sunday to preach at his historic church. Matt Galco traveled to Georgia to talk to the pastor and senator about how his faith influences his politics. It's Easter Sunday at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. These same pews bore witness to sermons by Martin Luther King Jr. as he led the civil rights movement. Still to fight on. The church is close to politics once again, as the senior pastor of Ebenezer is also Georgia's junior senator. He will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
From the pulpit to the plow fields of rural Georgia, Raphael Warnock is attempting to balance his first full term in the Senate. Someone might ask, why would a preacher get involved in something as messy as politics? I'm a patriot. I love America. Only in America is my story possible. You're looking at a kid who grew up in public housing. I serve in the United States Senate. Warnock is battle-tested. His recent re-election victory over opponent Herschel Walker needed a special runoff election to decide the outcome. It was the second time Warnock won under the circumstances in the past two election cycles. He won a special election in 2020 to become Georgia's first black senator and the first Democrat elected to represent the state in the Senate in 20 years. While the political victories raised his profile, government wasn't always part of the plan. I'm a Matthew 25 Christian. Uh, you know, in as much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. When you feed the hungry, when you clothe those who are naked, when you visit those who are sick and in prison. And so that's the work that I've tried to do as a pastor. And what I found out is, is that over time, my ministry at Ebenezer Baptist Church um, took me into the public square. Warnock says his faith drives him when advocating for things like racial justice, reducing gun violence. As a pastor, I'm, I'm praying for those who are affected by this tragedy, but I hasten to say that thoughts and prayers are not enough. And expanding health care. He helped get the price of insulin capped at $35 for Medicare recipients as part of the Inflation Reduction Act passed last year. He's now trying to extend that to people with private insurance. Warnock and Oklahoma Republican Senator James Lankford are the Senate's only two ordained ministers. While scriptures they both read are from the same book, the partisan divides remain on a variety of topics, none more evident than the issue of abortion. Lankford is outspokenly pro-life, while Warnock labels himself as a pro-choice pastor. You have not been shy about saying you're a pro-choice pastor. You know, to some Christians out there at least, they're probably sitting at home and saying, well, this guy's not a real Christian then. I mean, my, my faith is so basic to who I am. Um, I, I don't f feel a need to uh, defend uh, my Christian identity. I'm a man of faith. I love the Lord with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. And um, Christians have a whole range of differences on a whole range of issues. And um, for me, the acid test of your faith is the depth of your commitment to the most marginalized members of the human family. Do you find it hard as a pastor to find a biblical defense for being pro-choice? Oh, my, my stance as a pro-choice pastor is not in spite of my Christian identity, it's because of my Christian identity. Uh, I believe in human agency and I believe in choice. Um, look, um, I, I have a deep reference, reverence for life, profound reverence for life, uh, and I have a respect for choice. To Warnock, having the freedom to choose also means the government should be supporting women and families faced with difficult decisions on unplanned pregnancies. He sponsored a bill with Senator Marco Rubio aimed at improving maternal mortality rates. He's advocated for expanding the child tax credit that aids low-income families. Senator Rubio and I don't agree on the reproductive choice question, but if the issue is life, what we both recognize is that this country's maternal mortality rate is criminally high, and it's something we can actually do something about. If a member of your congregation came up to you and said, well, Pastor, Senator, I like you a lot. I like what you have to say. But Psalm 139.16, I knew you before you were born. I just, I just can't get with you on that pro-choice, pro-life debate. The question is, whose choice is it? And I, I still believe that a patient's room is too small and cramped a space for a woman, her doctor, and the United States government. And I think um, as we're seeing this debate play out, Right now, um, there is diversity on that point, even inside of the evangelical Christian community. Warnock has proven so far his brand of sermons and service can win in a new political battleground in Georgia. 
It's not too early for pundits to toss his name around when talking about future presidential candidates, but it is too early for him to consider it right now. So a pastor is in the Senate. Could a pastor be in the White House? I think so. Um, look, we need all kinds of people serving in all kinds of places. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm focused on serving the people of Georgia, and I, I still, every few days, pinch myself. I can't believe I get to do this work. And um, I'm looking forward to serving the people of Georgia for a long time. In Atlanta, Georgia, Matt Galka, CBN News. Well, that's an inside look at Senator Warnock, probably a look you're not going to see on any other TV program. I obviously disagree with him on pro-life. My position is quite clear. From the foundation of the world, before God even created the foundation, he thought of good things for you and me to do. And when we terminate a life, we're cutting off the good thing. We're cutting off God's dream for us. Let's have a culture where we encourage motherhood. Let's have a culture where we celebrate it, where we support it, where we provide the finances for it, where we help women in their time of need. And we help them not just in their pregnancy, but we help them raise their kids. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Can we all come to agreement on that? That's an America I want to live in. That's an America I want to give to my children and now my grandchildren. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Could we all come to agreement on that? DJ and Brandon kept paying their bills, and yet they couldn't make a dent in their debt. Before long, they were $137,000 in the red. Here's how they managed to pay it all off in just five years. Before they married, Brandon and DJ didn't think twice about their spending or their debt. We were looking more at the world around us and what our image would look like if we had something at a higher status. You know, I wanted to have this type of car. And it was like, oh, I have to have these shoes when they release. I didn't really have a budget. It was like, oh, as long as I can make the minimum payments, no late fees, I'm good. And if emergency popped up, credit cards were my, my savings. During her single years and after becoming a Christian, Brandon took a class at church on money management. She tried to practice the budgeting principles she learned, but wasn't consistent and continued to spend. Meanwhile, she began tithing to her church. When I started tithing, it was I, I needed to, I had to. And over the years, as I changed my mindset, it became I want to, to help others, to serve others, to advance the kingdom of the Lord. DJ also gave a church and to community causes, but he still spent without concern for the future. And when Brandon and DJ tied the knot, nothing changed. They made expensive purchases for their life together, and their joint debt grew. Soon, they decided to buy a bigger home for their expanding family and were shocked to see how much interest they'd be charged on the loan. That prompted them to finally face their overspending and the interest on their consumer debt and student loans. And I was like, you realize we just pay, we pay like every year thousands of dollars in interest for something that's, you know, like a credit card that's $2,000, but we're getting hit every month for like $150 when our payment is $200. We're not making any progress at all, at all. The couple decided it was time to get a handle on the way they managed money. They cut up their credit cards and pledged to pay off their total debt of $137,000. To do so, Brandon, a VP of a large nonprofit, took a job waitressing. DJ was an accountant, and he got a second job too. Whatever we made, it was going back to our debt, uh, tackling it from the smallest to largest. At one point, while paying down their debt, Brandon chose to stop tithing from her income. It was like, you really, really, really need, you know, you need that money to pay towards debt. And so I let the enemy get my ear. I stopped trusting. You know, I took it back. I knew what I was doing was wrong, and uh, it ate me up inside, like spiritually. After a year of not tithing, Brandon says God spoke to her. In my quiet time and, you know, in prayer time, I just heard God, like, you know, uh, trust me, be a faithful tither. Like, trust me, I brought you this far, I'm not going to leave you. You don't need to pause your tithe, continue to give, and continue to pay off your debt. It can be done. Brandy and I really did a lot of soul searching. Part of what I would say our journey was focused on is God's guidance. And so we started looking more spiritually, looking inward, and saying, we really have to humble ourselves. Brandon began tithing again, and the couple watched what they spent while they continued to work off their debt. I started to prefer the feeling of being debt-free 
than needing something that would build my image. One material thing just makes me want another material thing. Getting rid of one debt does not make me want another debt. It was giving me um, encouragement, making me want to pay off another debt. In five years, the Rodriguez has paid off all $137,000 of their debt. They say the process changed their perspective on money and God. I learned how to take my hands off any and every situation, you know, trusting the Lord, trusting Him in my finances, in my marriage, in my children. Uh, I became the man that I was called to be, the husband I needed to be, the father. We literally would have not have been able to do this without God's grace. Today, Brandon and DJ are committed to budgeting and staying out of debt. They encourage others to manage money God's way. Not only are we called to be fishers of men, but be better stewards with our finances. Give a little more. Dedicate yourself to becoming more disciplined to your faith than you can be dedicated and disciplined to your budget. I believe in being obedient to the Word of God. I try to teach my children the same thing as well, whether it's uh, their, their, their tithe and their offering. When you truly trust Him, follow Him, follow His guidelines when it comes to these things, and you will be blessed and He will make a way. And he will make a way for you. All you have to do is be obedient to what he tells you to do. When you read these things in the Bible, when you read it in the New Testament, Jesus couldn't be any clearer. Give and it will be given unto you. Here it is from 1 Timothy. Tell those who are rich not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. But their pride and trust should be in the living God who always richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. When you do that, you'll have enjoyment in life. Isn't that wonderful? Who doesn't want that? Let's have enjoyment in life by helping other people. If you want to start a lifestyle of doing this, this isn't certainly a, a get-rich-quick scheme, anything like that. It's certainly not an on-and-off thing where, you know, you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for a time, and then, then, I'll, then I'll stop. No. When you dedicate your life to say, I want to be a cheerful, I want to be a generous giver, that's when the enjoyment comes. If you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. We have 1,000 Club which is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. Now, when you call and join, I want you to have this. It's a wonderful new teaching from my father. It's a book called The Shepherd King on the Life of David. Now, you'll get an audio copy of this book, four audio CDs. You can also stream it. You can also download it. Uh, you get one copy when you join at 700 Club. You get three copies when you join at 700 Club Gold, so you have plenty to share with your family. And then if you join at 1,000 Club, you'll get five copies. Either way, do it now and say, yes, I want to be a part of it. 1-800-700-7000. Charlie? Hadija was only 13 years old when she was forced into an arranged marriage. What's worse, this child bride's husband beat her repeatedly. Hadija still bears the physical scars of his abuse. But now, thanks to you, she and her young daughter have a happy home and a future full of hope. At the tender age of 13, Hadija was forced to marry against her will. My husband was very abusive. I went back to my parents and told them I couldn't stay because he beat me often. I have scars from what his abuse did to me. They told me to be patient and to persevere, that he would change. I endured the pain until it was just too much to bear. One day, I was in our house, and something kept telling me to get up and go. I couldn't resist the voice. I stood up, walked away, and came to a home of a Christian lady. She opened her door to me and introduced me to her pastor. They prayed with me and led me to Christ. With my husband being a Muslim, I knew I wouldn't survive going back after I became a Christian. A pastor connected her with Christian Faith Ministries, which is partly supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. Now, 18-year-old Hadija and her daughter stay in our crisis care home. 
They have everything they need to grow and prosper. Before coming here, I felt so lost. You opened your arms to me and helped me heal. This is a family and this is our home. Through your Christian discipleship program, you've helped me grow in my relationship with God. I talk with him and he answers me. Everything in me is happy because of Jesus. Many different vocational programs are offered here. Hadija enrolled in sewing classes. I make dresses for myself and my daughter. Sometimes she'll sit on my lap and it's like we are doing it together. It's so exciting to say I made this. Both of them also attend school here. It's an indescribable joy learning to read and write in English. It's like magic. My world has changed completely. In Nigeria, a lot of young girls are given as child brides against their will. Sometimes I wonder why God saved me and gave me this place of refuge. I want to become a lawyer so I can help young girls and give them a future. I'm amazed at how much mercy and grace I have been blessed with here. Thank you for your kindness and heart for God. May God give you the grace and strength to keep doing His good work. May He continue to open doors for you to help others. And may your blessings never end. What a wonderful story. And if you are a member of CBN, the 700 Club, you are helping us to make a difference in Hadija's life and in the lives of many around the world. And so we want to invite you, if you're not a partner, to become a partner with us in the wonderful work that we're doing around the world. It's really easy. All you have to do is pick up your phone and give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And our counselors will encourage you to become a member of the 700 Club. You can let them know. I I want to join just 65 cents a day, $20 a month will cause you to be a member of the 700 Club. Or if you want, you can become a member of the 700 Club Gold, which is $40 a month. Also, we have the $84 a month Thousand Club membership. Just let the counselor know which level you want to join. You might even want to be a 2500 Club member at $209 a month or even become a founder for $417 a month. Just give us a call. Let us know what you'd like to partner with us and so you can make a difference and as our way of saying thank you we'd love to send you Pat Robertson's the Shepherd King teaching it is rich teaching that is sure to bless you and encourage you and grow you in your faith we'd love to send you a copy as you call and become a member of the 700 Club just give us a call 1-800-700-7000 call today Gordon Mrs. Zong could see her baby's teeth from the inside on the outside that's because her child was born with a severe cleft lip, and it would take 10 years to raise the money that they needed to have the surgery. When Mrs. Zhang found out she was pregnant, she started knitting a sweater. I put all my love into every stitch of that sweater. She was shocked when May was born with a cleft lip and palate. It was terrible. I could see her teeth inside from the outside, but I wouldn't give up on her because she was my baby. Some neighbors blamed the couple for May's cleft lip. They said Allah was punishing us, but I worshipped five times a day. May's cleft lip caused serious problems. She couldn't speak clearly. She fell and always hit her mouth. Sometimes it bled. And then her cleft lip and the palate got worse. She couldn't eat much, so she was malnourished and weak. My poor little girl. Mrs. Zhang tried to protect May, so she hid her daughter's face when they went out. I think the world is very unfriendly. People whispered behind May's back. I was afraid that when she grew up, people would bully her even more and no man would want a girl with a cleft lip and a pellet. The couple got their hopes up when they saw an advertisement about cleft lip surgery. Then they heard how much it would cost. It would take 10 years to raise the money, and that would be without eating. I didn't know where to get so much money. It was a lot of pressure. We would go bankrupt and be homeless. Mr. Zhang worked hard to save anyway. 
Then a friend told the couple about Operation Blessing, and May got surgery. I couldn't believe that strangers were willing to pay for May's operation. May changed a lot. She eats well and speaks clearly. People around us didn't help, but you did. This is love. Everyone says May's a little princess. It's my dream come true. She's very cheerful and likes to show off her beautiful smile. I thank the kind-hearted people at Operation Blessing, especially since our beliefs are so different. Thank you for accepting us. Thank you for making surgery possible for me so she can live a good life. That thank you goes all the way from China to you, if you're a member of the 700 Club. Because of you, because you cared enough to give, you're helping people all around the world. You're saying yes. When people have need, you're saying yes. How can I help you? That wonderful baby, that wonderful family, yes, we want to help them. And if you are a member, I encourage it. Could you consider going to 700 Club Gold? That's $40 a month. You could also go to 1,000 Club. Charlene talked about the upper clubs. We have 2,500, which is 2,500 a year. Founder, $5,000 or more a year. And just imagine the number of people that will be helped by your gift. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Uh, it, it's all necessary for these special surgeries that we do, for the water wells we do, for the livelihood programs we do, for the feeding programs we do, for all the disaster relief that happens here and around, around the world. It's all made possible because people, just like you, care enough to give. So if you want to do that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you, Power for Life monthly, monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go to CBN.com and you give monthly on the Internet. You automatically sign up for it. We also have a new text to give where you can text the letter CBN to 71777. Either way, do it right now. Now, I've got something else for you that uh, when, you, when, you, when you join the 700 Club, our way of saying thank you is to send this gift. It's my father's latest audio book about the life of David. Get Pat Robertson's latest audio book, The Shepherd King, The Life of David. Explore the life of one of the Bible's most beloved heroes. You'll discover how a humble shepherd rose to become the mighty king of Israel. His example can guide your life. David's prophetic voice can strengthen your faith. His spiritual insights can inspire you today. Plus, learn how David changed the course of history. Enjoy Pat Robertson's latest audiobook, The Shepherd King, The Life of David, when you become a CBN partner. You'll also receive After God's Own Heart, a 10-day devotional from the Psalms of David. Get this exclusive audiobook, The Shepherd King, The Life of David, and the devotional After God's Own Heart today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com. Available now. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. President Biden lamented the record high number of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States, calling them a stain on the soul of America. The president marked Jewish American Heritage Month Tuesday at the White House, where he highlighted his administration's efforts to fight anti-Semitism. He said it's necessary to increase awareness of the attacks and to improve safety and security for the Jewish community. While the United States Secret Service is investigating an intrusion at the home of a top White House official, a man entered the home of National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan around 3 a.m. last month. Sullivan confronted the man who then left his home. Confirmation of the investigation comes as there are growing concerns over attacks on public officials. Monday, police say a man with a baseball assaulted two staffers in Virginia, Congressman Jerry Connolly's office in Northern Virginia. Attacks and threats on lawmakers are up 400% over the last six years. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com.
Well, it's been said that the Christian life is not just a difficult, it's nearly impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit. According to Charisma Stephen Strang, never has that statement been truer than today. Founder and CEO of Charisma Media, Stephen Strang, says there's only one power big enough to help you survive and thrive in this crazy world. After covering how God is moving around the world for more than four decades as a journalist, Stephen has firsthand experience of how the Holy Spirit has led him on a remarkable journey of faith and given him a meaningful life. In his book, Spirit-Led Living in an Upside-Down World, Stephen reminds us that no matter what happens in the world, the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome. Well, Stephen Strang is here with us and our dear friend. Welcome. Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you. It's always good to be with you. And welcome to, back with your new book, Spirit-Led Living, Spirit Living in an Upside-Down World. Uh, have, have we gotten more comfortable as a culture now talking about the third person of the Trinity, talking about the Holy Spirit, or is he still mysterious to a large number of Christians? Well, of course, he's mysterious to a lot of people, but it doesn't matter. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit just to survive as individuals. I see a lot of Christians getting discouraged or feeling that the other side is winning. You know, they're not, it's not. And there's always been a need for the Holy Spirit all the way back to the beginning of the church. Yeah, well, that and there's is, always there been is difficult no times. But the thing is that God put us here now. We have no choice. So how are we going to survive and how are we going to make a difference? And in a way, I've been writing and about this my whole career. But I just thought people are discouraged. I wanted them to have hope. And the thing is, we can survive. We can survive. We can depend on the Holy Spirit. We can experience the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. We can have power to overcome trials. We can overcome Satan's attack and what we call deliverance. All of this is just for the asking, but it, after a while, it's kind of like been there, done that, and or it doesn't seem to work, and and I think it's an attack of the Satan. Of Satan, it's 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 spiritual warfare, and we know, Paul said, you know, you know this well that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I'm just trying to remind people what the Word of God says, and to try to maybe help them understand and to realize that there's really something more that they can have than just a dismal uh, Christian life. And worse than that, some evangelical Christians are kind of going woke, thinking that it's a new thing. No, we need to be more powerful than ever. We need to believe in miracles and healing and all of these kinds of things. Now, you would know that this ministry was built on that. And uh, it's time to get back to basics, and that's why I wrote this book. I love one of the images you use, which is having the Holy Spirit in your life is like wearing scuba gear. Uh, and if you've ever been scuba diving or snorkeling, you know, well, you never take the mask off. You never, you, 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 you can't. If you do, you will die. Uh, why, why is that image so powerful for today? Well, it helps us to understand what's going on. I have to give credit to Fred Price, which I heard him say that years ago. But the scuba gear helps you to exist in a hostile environment that you said would kill you. Well, that's what our world is like. The world and the culture and everything will kill you if you don't have the Holy Spirit with you. Now, you know, the analogy only goes so far. We don't put the Holy Spirit in, in, in tanks. But the idea that we can survive in a hostile environment, and we can. Even with everything going on, I mean, watching this show is just how upside down the world is. You can get discouraged watching the news. And, and then after a while, your head is in the sand. I mean, it, it goes from bad to worse. But you know what? We can overcome that. Yeah. And it's as easy as just reaching out to the Holy Spirit, experience the power of the Holy Spirit, experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't want to talk about that, but there's something powerful about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead who empowers us. It's, it's the normative Christian life. It's what Jesus said that he would send power. He would send a comforter. It's there for the asking. Most people 
Just don't ask. Yeah, we can't fill our tanks, but we can definitely fill ourselves. That's exactly uh, and right. You can fill your lungs. I mean, it's the breath of God. Breathe on me. Fill me again. That's the breath of God that made us living souls to begin with. Let's just reinvigorate that. One of the things you emphasize in the book is the importance of hearing God and hearing the voice of God. I can quote the scripture, my sheep hear my voice. But for many people today, when you start talking, God told me, they start thinking, well, you're, you're hearing voices, there's something crazy going on. What, what would you answer them? How, how easy is it to hear the voice of the Lord? You know, if you walk with God, you do hear his voice. And the Lord speaks to us all the time. We don't know. In fact, if you have a decision to do right or do wrong, or maybe compromise in some way, or be passive when you shouldn't be, it's the Holy Spirit prompting you. If, you, if you're trying to live for the Lord, if you're trying to follow the Bible, if you're a mature Christian, that's the Lord speaking. And, but most people never stop. If we pray, when we pray, we ask the Lord for a lot of things, and then we say amen, and it's over. But actually, we need to hear from God. People like Benny Hinn have helped people to understand. We've got to commune with God and to hear his voice. In the book, I quote, you know, because I'm a journalist, I quote a lot of people. There's stories in there on Reinhard Bonnke, who heard from the Lord to reach out to his unsaved uh, brother, who was crying out to God and say, God, if you're real, speak to me through my brother. It was a, it was a, a gift of the spirit, a word of knowledge. And um, uh, Papa Hagen, as we call uh, Kenneth Hagen, yeah. senior, uh, there's a whole section in there of teaching of how he heard, um, how he learned to hear that inner voice that you're talking about. And the Holy Spirit can be our friend, our comforter, uh, he can be with us all day long, but most of us, we don't hear it in our, most pastors don't talk about it. So a book like this allows you, whether you are taught it in your church or not, to dive in. Uh, it's not so much what I say, I quote from other people and really the word of God. All of this is in the Bible. It's all there. But most of us, we don't connect the dots or we don't understand what scriptures and I hope that my book will help people to understand, to go deeper. There's a hunger. There's a deep, deep hunger. In fact, the way the world is, is forcing us to reach out for God in a way that if everything was going perfect, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to do it. So in a way, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And God is doing something new. I sense that there's something in the spirit realm that's happening. Uh, I talk in there about um, revival coming. And of course, in, in Christian circles, that sometimes is kind of like a cliche, but even people like Smith Wigglesworth and others prophesied a great revival. Sid Roth believes that we're gonna have the greatest revival of all time. And I pray that that's the case, but whether that happens or not, each of us in our own lives have to walk with, this, with the Spirit of God. We've got to be led by the Spirit. Well, I'll, I'll quote the Apostle Paul, the final ingathering of the Gentiles. I think it's happening right now. Uh, the entire world is seeing it, and we're seeing new Christians in numbers the church has never seen. For someone who has never heard the voice or, or is saying, well, how do I do it? What would you tell them? What would be the first step? Well, first of all, they need to repent of their sins. They need to ask the Holy Spirit to infill them. They need to forgive they need to be sure they're a clean vessel. And they say, Lord, speak to me. You know, uh, I, I tell them their story about Mike Bickle. Every time he's in a situation, he, he, and, and in the book, he walks through it. Um, Lord, what do you want me to say to this person right now? Yeah. Uh, is there something that you're wanting me to minister to someone? Show me. Uh, is there, uh, show me the shortcomings in my life that you're wanting to improve. That's okay. how you learn. There's a lot more in the book. It's called Spirit-Led Living in an Upside-Down World. It's available nationwide. And Stephen, thanks for being with us. Here's a scripture from Galatians. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.